good morning. If you've got a Bible, let's go first to Galatians chapter 5. That's in the New Testament, and we can uh, begin there. But I want to kind of ask you to do something for me this morning. Keep your Bibles open. Uh, We're going to be traveling through a number of different passages today. Something rare, if you're visiting with us today, this is not a norm for us where we uh, will look at so many different passages today, but we're covering a large perspective and understanding about giving. We're in our third week and our final week of a series that we've been calling Live Generously, and this idea of living a life of generosity. And so this morning we come to that conclusion, and the title of the message is Giving is Having. And so we've got to work our way through this perspective and a true biblical understanding of giving and generosity. Just to give you a heads up as we begin next week, can you believe it will be the month of October when we reconvene next Sunday? But we will be studying a, a series for five Sundays in the month of October on bless and I've invited Mike Lewis our associate pastor to partner with me and he'll be sharing one of those messages with us in that five-week series on how we can bless this generation how we can bless our children and our grandchildren but but that's to come we need to deal with where we are today you see the most controversial and uncomfortable subject in the global church today is money it's giving It's been said that the most sensitive nerve in the human body is the one that runs from our brains to our wallets. And I think that's because money has such a significant power in our lives. We all come from different backgrounds. We come from different families, which likely means we were all taught and then learned a different idea and a different understanding about giving. And so as a result, we approach money from a variety of perspectives. And given that money is a major component of our lives, that it has either the power to help us and then to help others, or it also has the power to hurt us and hurt others, then I think it's time that we have a proper biblical perspective on giving and the concept of generosity. See, generosity begins with freedom. If you're a note taker, I invite you to take some notes and you'll find a place for you to do that on the back of your worship guide. And the first thing I would encourage you to write down and remember is that generosity begins with freedom. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. This is where we're beginning, but it'll also be where we end. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says it was for freedom underline that word it was for freedom that Christ has set us free therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery freedom is about generosity because generosity begins with freedom now here in Galatians 5 it tells us that Jesus gave his life so that we can live in freedom. Now there's, there's two aspects to that. We have been set free because of what Christ did on the cross from our sins. Amen? We've been set free from that. But the, he also goes on to say, so that you would not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Listen, my friends, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We stand firmly in that. But he also died so that you could find freedom from, are you ready? The law. Freedom from the law. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. I came that you might find freedom from that. And that's super, uber critical for us to understand this concept of generosity. You've been set free. Set free from sin. Set free from the yoke of slavery of the law. And Charles Spurgeon said this, the great theologian. He said, giving is true having. Once again, giving is true having. When we give generously, then we have more than we could ever imagine, don't we? It's impossible 
to fulfill Deuteronomy 6, such a foundational passage for our church and how we model faith for the next generation. It's impossible to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and not have a desire to be generous. It's impossible. You've been set free. And so the Bible teaches that in Christ there is no condemnation. In Christ, I am already blessed with every spiritual blessing. That's what the Bible says. And so it's time for a proper perspective to find freedom in order that we might learn to live generously. Proverbs 11.25 is a verse that I think is pivotal to us understanding generosity and this concept of freedom. The writer of Proverbs says, The generous man will be prosperous now look he did not put this in the the order that sometimes we read it as sometimes we think the prosperous man will be generous no the writer said the generous man will be prosperous generosity my friends is what leads to prosperity it's the freedom to be generous and the writer goes on to say in that verse and he who waters will himself be Watered. What does that mean? What is that under, how does that compare to this idea of generosity? Very simply this. When you replenish others, you will be replenished. When you replenish others, when you are generous, you find prosperity. And in that generosity, you replenish others. And then you are watered. You are replenished yourself. And so what I want us to do this morning is to seek to answer Three questions when it comes to this idea of generosity and giving is true having. And so in order to do that, we've got to backtrack. So I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. All the way back to the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 8. And we're going to answer the first question this morning of what is your motivation for living generously? That's important to answer. What's your motivation? We have to identify that. And we're going to look at three concepts, three different points of motivation, all beginning with P. Isn't that good? It's fun, right? We're going to look at protection, provision, and profit. And likely, in one of these three, you're going to determine what your motivation for giving is. What your motivation for generosity is. Look with me. Genesis chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 15. Now this is following the time of the flood, and Noah has finally found dry ground. And look what, what happens. Pick up the story, Genesis 8, verse 15. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals And every creeping, I like to say every creepy thing, that creeps on the earth and that may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Now watch what happens, verse 18. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creepy thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth, they went out by their families from the ark. Verse 20, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. So the first thought when... What's your motivation? Is your motivation for generosity because of God's protection of you and your family? That's why Noah builds an altar. You see that in verse 20. After surviving this flood of 40 days and 40 nights, everything and every person except what is on this ark has now been destroyed. And Noah comes off of that and he builds an altar and he offers an offering To God, Noah recognizes God's generosity towards him and how God had protected him. And so he offers a burnt offering. What about you? 
motivation for being generous if giving is true having because how God has protected you, the storms that you faced, the floods that have come over you, the waves that have crashed in on your family time and time again. Have you withheld generosity because of the storm or have you supplied generosity because of God's protection in the storm? You see, his motivation for giving, for building this altar, was to thank God for his protection during the flood. And so God responds to Noah's generous heart by making a covenant. Look over in chapter 9, beginning in verse 12. Here's the covenant. Because of Noah's generosity... Right? Generosity leads to prosperity. Not the other way around. Because of Noah's generosity, and he makes this burnt offering, he says, thank you, God, for protecting me. Verse 12, and God says, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all successive generations, that's us. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the clouds. Right? That rainbow. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on this earth. And watch what Noah says. And or God says to Noah. This is the sign of the covenant. That I have established. Between me and all the flesh that is on this earth. God says your generosity Noah. Your gratitude Noah. Your willingness to be generous. In supplying a burnt offering. Because of my protection that I gave you during the flood. I'm going to make a covenant for every generation to come. Are you motivated? To be generous because of how God has protected you and your family in the darkest days of your life. It should. It should motivate us and lead us to be generous and replenish others. And in that moment, we are replenished. Well, the second P of motivation we have to look at is in Genesis 14. So just a few chapters over and look what happens. Genesis chapter 14, we read about another man by the name of Abraham. So Noah was generous because of God's protection. And now we're going to read about Abram's generosity because of God's provision. Look at Genesis chapter 14. And let's read in verse 20. And so after God has given victory to Abram, He gives a gift, verse 20, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your your enemies into your hand. He gave a tenth of all he had. Now, why is that important? Well, after this victory, Abram decides that he is going to give a tenth of the spoils to God and to Melchizedek. He says, I... I have been blessed. I have been provided by God this victory over my enemies. And he is motivated then in his generosity to give back. You read about this in a confirmation of this particular story in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 4. You can go and read that for yourself. But Abram wanted to say thank you to God for for giving him the victory. And in that he gave an offering of 10% of the spoils. So he took the the victory spoils and he took the very best of the spoils and he gave a tenth to God. Now listen to me very, very closely. We know that Abraham lives to be 150 years of age. There is not another single account in Scripture that ever says that Abram ever gave a tenth again. 
Did you know that? He lives to be 150 years old and never again does it say that Abraham gave a tenth just right here in Genesis chapter 14. Why is that important? It's important because generosity begins with freedom. And if God has provided for you over and abundant, your cup runneth over, then should you simply minimize your generosity to a percentage? You see, the motivation for Abraham's generosity was not driven by a percentage. It was driven by God's provision. He gave to him the victory over everything. And Abram says, I am going to give back. Friends, how has God provided for you? How has He protected you in life's storms? And how has He provided for you more than you could ever have imagined, more than you ever needed? God's generosity has given to you the freedom To then be generous. He's provided these things. And that should be the motivation in our our giving back. Not the amount, but the reason, the why, the desire, the provision. All that God has given us. Well, There's also someone else we have to look at when we talk about motivation, and that's Jacob, Genesis chapter 28. It's interesting here that Jacob does not give to God because of God's protection. Jacob does not give to God because of God's provision. No, Jacob is in it for himself. Jacob gives to God for profit. Look at chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set up a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz, verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, are you ready? If God, underline that, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I will take and I will and he, give me food, food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house and of all of that, are you ready? You give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Jacob's not in it for God's protection and provision. Jacob's in it for profit. God, if you will protect me on this journey, if you'll give me food and garments, and if you'll return me back in safety, then and only then, God, will I give you a tenth of what you've given me. You ever said that? You see, that's called bargaining with God. You ever bargained with God? Mighty generous of Jacob, isn't it? (laughs) I'll give you a tenth, God, if you'll take care of all these other things. I'll I'll give you this, this part back. That's not generosity, that's bargaining. Maybe you've said this. God, if you get me through this crisis, I'll never skip church again. You bargained? God, if you get me this new job, I'll give 10%, no less. God, if you get me through this, I'll be a better spouse. God, if you take care of that, I'll never drink again. Your motivation is not protection and provision. Your motivation is profit. Your motivation is I want something out of what I'm going to give back to you, God. (laughs) If giving is true having then we have been given the choice to express our attitude of giving from our hearts because it begins with freedom. You see, Jesus always questioned the motivation of others, didn't he? I mean, he used the illustration, if I can find it, Luke chapter 21, 
beginning in verse 1. And he looked and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting two small copper coins in. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all had out of their surplus put into the offering. But she, out of her, what? Poverty. Put in all that she had to live on. Friends, you have to ask yourself, who gave the most? See, she didn't give 10%. She gave 100. Out of her poverty, she gave everything. What's your motivation? You want something back for your gift? You want something to gain in our congregation because of your gift? To gain from the kingdom? Or do you just give because the freedom to give generously to the work of what God is doing? Giving is true having. But you've got to answer the question of motivation. The second question we have to answer this morning is, can we or how do we establish a movement of generosity. Once we know our motivation, once we've declared that and we've defined it, we've cleared it up, we know what our motivation is, the reason why we're generous, then how do we start, how do we establish this movement of generosity? Boy, I'm glad you asked that question this morning. Exodus chapter 25. I told you we had a lot of ground to cover, right? Exodus chapter 25. Friends, there have been a number of movements throughout the centuries of our history as a nation. Movements have a way of changing the course of history, like the Civil Rights Movement. What would happen if Bacon Heights established a movement towards generosity and biblical stewardship like what is found in Exodus 25 that we're going to read in just a moment and Exodus 36 where we're going from here. The first P of this particular question is partnership. Partnership. You create a movement, you establish a movement of generosity when you decide you want to partner with God. Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution. Underline that, raise a contribution. Tell the sons of Israel to give generously for me. From every man whose heart moves him. There's another one underline. Whose heart moves him. And you shall raise my contribution. This is the contribution which you are to raise from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet material from linen. Goat hair, ram skin, dyed red. Other skins, acacia wood. Oil for lighting. Spices for the anointing of oil and for the fragrant incense. Stones and the setting of stones. Let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them. Verse 9, according to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furniture, just so you shall construct it. And so God says to the sons of Israel, you want to begin a movement of generosity? You know what your motivation is now? Then here's the deal. I'm gonna, I want to find a place on earth called the tabernacle. And if you want to partner with me on this mission of raising contributions, of living a life of generosity, you want to partner with me, then you start bringing your gifts. We're going to build a tabernacle. Now, why is that important? You see, the tabernacle would be the unique dwelling place of Almighty God on earth and with His people. That's important. Because this was not required giving. This was not like the Levite, Le, the Levite tithe or the festival tithe or the, corner, the four corners tithe or any of those kind of things that would add up to much more than 10%. This was not required giving. It says those who want to give willingly from their heart. It's an expression of devotion to the God. Scripture says whose heart moves him, who's partnering with me, wants to be part of something bigger than themselves, then you collect a contribution from those whose heart is devoted. And the tabernacle would eventually become the temple, right? 
And the temple would eventually become what? You and me. Process that for a minute. The sons of Israel, by God, commanded to raise a contribution to build a tabernacle where God is going to dwell with His people. And as we study Scripture, the tabernacle eventually becomes the temple. The same thing, where God is dwelling with His people. And then Christ comes, and He dies on the cross. And the temple is now you and me. Because of the Holy Spirit, the Almighty God dwells within us. We are the temple of God. But it began with the tabernacle when people partnered with Him to begin a movement of generosity. Because of Christ, when He says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of God? And the people of God were called to partner with God on creating this movement toward generosity for God. That was the sole purpose. And then watch what happens. Chapter 36 of Exodus. Watch what happens when the people's hearts are right and generosity takes root. This is so awesome. This just fires me up beyond belief. Exodus 36, beginning in verse 2. And then Moses called his boy B and O. That's how I'm going to say it, all right? Because I can't pronounce those names. So he calls his boy B and O. And every skillful person in whom the Lord had put skill, and everyone whose heart stirred in him. So chapter 25 You find those whose heart moves them, and now in chapter 36, it's those whose heart stirred him to come to the work to perform it. They received from Moses all the contributions which the sons of Israel had brought to perform the work in the construction of the sanctuary, the tabernacle. And they still continued bringing to him free will offerings. They were giving generously every morning. And all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary, the tabernacle, came, and each from the work which he was performing. And they said to Moses, hang on, oh, this is going to get exciting. The people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work, which the Lord commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command. A proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, oh, this is cool. Let no man or woman any longer perform work for the contributions of the tabernacle. Thus the people were restrained. Underline that. They were restrained from bringing any more. For the material they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. Holy moly. The people were so stoked and excited about partnering with God. And he was going to dwell with us. Almighty God's going to be with us in the tabernacle. All we got to do is give and we make this thing happen. It's the generosity of whose hearts moved him and are stirred. And the next thing you know, they said, we don't want to just partner. We want to participate. I want to be in this thing. So they lived generously. And they continued to bring offerings every morning. And so what happens is the construction crew calls a committee meeting with Moses. And they don't want to talk about the dimensions of the project. They don't want to talk to Moses about how they're going to miss the deadline of completing the project. They don't want to talk to Moses about how it's going to cost more than what they originally thought it was for the project. They called Moses together to tell him, to tell the people to do what? Stop giving. Are you serious? Stop giving. Tell your people, Moses. Quit it. Knock it off. Stop giving. The people were bringing more than enough for the project and the craftsmen of this tabernacle. Tell Moses, look, bro, you got to tell your people. Enough's enough. And the sons of Israel had created a movement toward generosity. And you know what? Others wanted to participate in the movement. I want to be a part of that. And Moses commands them not to bring any more. He restrains them from giving. How cool would that be? Friends, I'm here to tell you. 
if we will buy into what God is doing in this church. If we will sell out to the vision that He has for our future. If we will partner and participate in the plan of living generous, we would never again be behind budget. Ever. And we could move forward with our building project without fear or worry. Listen, I believe, and call me, chalk chalk this up to being young and ignorant, overly optimistic, call it what you want. But I believe that Bacon Heights could have an Exodus 36 moment in our history. I believe that. And I want to be a part of something like that. I want to respond to the grace of God in such a way that it creates a movement for others to live generously. But we have to determine our motivation. And then we establish and participate in something bigger than ourselves. Well, quickly, the last question we have to answer this morning is how do you measure generosity? How do you measure generosity? 2 Corinthians, New Testament, chapter 9, we're almost done. Verses 6 and 7. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then circle, underline, mark, verse 7. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Sometimes we think the only way to measure genuine generosity is by the amount given. But listen, we've already identified that generosity is what leads to prosperity, not prosperity makes us generous. And so you measure generosity by passion and purpose. The financial plan of God for supporting His church has always and will always continue to be measured by the heart of the person. No prodding, no pressure, no guilt, no percentage, no shame, no compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. And so you measure generosity not by the dollar amount, but by the passion and purpose of the heart of the person. And so whatever you purpose in your heart, it says, that's between you and God. So you evaluate what God is doing and how you can support His work, and then you become generous because you believe in the work and you have a passion for the job. A little girl wanted to give her daddy a watch for Christmas. He didn't need a watch or really want a watch. But this little girl purposed in her heart to buy her daddy a watch. And she brings him the package on Christmas morning and even helps him unwrap it. And with great delight in her eyes, she sees his response to her gift. And he received the watch with joy and love in his heart you realize the dad paid for the watch (laughs) and the gift came from him back to him through the heart of a child and that's the way God is towards us isn't he everything we have came from him He paid for our freedom. He paid for our ability to be generous. Generosity is just us returning a gift to Him 
that passes through our hearts and back into His hands. Scripture says man looks out the, at the outside. Man looks at the amount, the figure. God looks at the heart. Giving nothing. Hear me. Giving nothing is not an option if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Why? Because of freedom. You've been set free to live generously. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if we'll do one thing, one thing, my friends, we can live generously. Jesus said, I came to serve and not be served. If we will serve God and do that one thing well, we replenish others, we will be replenished. So I want you to pray about what you give. I want you to think about it. I want you to have a conversation in your home, your domestic church, the people you live with, about how you can leverage your service in order to live generous. And we have the potential. We have the potential to start an avalanche, a tidal wave of generosity over this church, this community, and this country. Because generosity begins with freedom. And giving is true having so that you can live generously. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, I pray that you have opened our eyes through your word. Not our own thinking, our own tradition.